Welcome to another mind-bending video about the nature of reality. Today, we're honored to share another exclusive Gaia episode with you, this time about the sacred geometry of sound and the intriguing question of whether our consciousness is created solely from our brains or if it taps into a field of consciousness beyond our material form. In this video, Gaia explores deeply the work of Nassim Haramein, a physicist and researcher who has been on this path of exploration for some time. According to his research, our brains are like antennas that can tap into a field of information beyond our bodies, much like a radio channeling signals from elsewhere. In addition to this, experts in the fields of spirituality, physics, and consciousness come together in this video to share their thoughts on the vibrational reality of our minds and intentions, and how our consciousness affects the physical world. By understanding the sacred geometry of sound and the vibrational frequencies that underlie our existence, we can learn to project positive energy and create a better world for ourselves and others. And so without further ado, prepare yourself to unlock the mysteries of consciousness and the nature of reality within. It's absolutely brilliant and very worth the watch. Right now, every one of us is in the process of thinking. What we may not realize is that this very process affects our reality. One of the fundamental principles in ancient indigenous spiritual traditions is the understanding that what we think and what we feel influences the physical world around us. American inventor Henry Ford famously said, whether you think you can, or you think you can't, you're right. In other words, your beliefs are frequencies mirrored in the world around you. It's our thoughts, feelings, emotions, and even our beliefs have physical representations in the world around us. Well, thoughts really direct our reality both from how we perceive and the things we make out of our reality and what's happening in our environment, and they can affect what we manifest out of the quantum field into our physical reality. Every time we think, every thought that we create in our head actually leaves our head as a wave of light. We know this because we can put a cap on someone's head with electrodes on it to pick up those waves of light and send them to a computer so we can analyze the brain. When you think about something, that information goes out eternally into space-time as a wave. From a physics perspective, all possibilities exist as potentials in the field, which is in constant motion in the quantum realm. And each of us has the ability to visualize and perhaps create these potentials. Expanded consciousness is the state of being awake and aware within this field. Now, as a scientist in the modern world, when I began to hear this, it didn't make sense because my conditioning was that we're separate from our world, that we have little influence over the body within us, let alone the world around us. But as the, the implications of quantum physics became widely known and more accessible, it became apparent how this relationship exists. If you're a distant civilization, you can pick up that radio frequency and you can actually decode it. So we know that thinking is important because it directly affects everything around us. Other people, other things, believe it or not, can quantum entangle with those waves of light and download the information that you were thinking. Japanese researcher Masaru Emoto studied how thoughts affect our physical world. He experimented with three beakers of rice and water. Every day for a month, he said thankful words to the first beaker. For the second one, he spoke hateful phrases to the rice, such as, you're an idiot. He completely ignored the third beaker. After 30 days, the first beaker of rice gave off a pleasant scent and began to ferment. The rice in the second beaker turned black 
and the rice in the third beaker started to rot. The worst rice samples is the one that was ignored. The same can be said in our daily lives when dealing with children. Ignoring children is the worst thing we can do. Even if we have to scold them occasionally, communication is very important. Communication, thoughts and behaviors have a frequency, which is why many cultures emphasize the importance of speaking, thinking and acting with integrity. And it's all about the words, the vibration, then the meaning that we give to those words, the vibration that we assign to those words. And this begins to help us to understand the true power of language in our lives. You did such a great job on this. Our thoughts could create static within the field. They could create, you know, interferences that get in the way of the things we're actually trying to manifest. We have all this subconscious thought that's also going on below the surface, and that creates a lot of ripples and static and unnecessary waves upon the field. And this begins to help us to understand how the power of a thought can influence the way that neurons connect, the way that entire neural networks connect, and our ability through those neural networks to communicate not only within us, but to the world around us. Our thoughts constantly affect the field, but what in the field influences our thoughts and consciousness? And what role does the brain play? When we observe the human brain, there's a few things that can be deceiving. Uh, one is that we think of it as the seat of consciousness. We think of it as this place where somehow consciousness is manufactured. I don't think that is accurate. You can think of the brain as like part of the antenna that the body is, is actually tapping into a field of information. Unstoppable. Just like a radio set doesn't have the band in it. It doesn't have the announcer in it. It doesn't have all the activities that you're hearing, the football game. Touchdown! It actually is just tapping into a field of information, electromagnetic waves that are being received by the antenna of the radio. You interpret what's coming in and you send it back through the nature of your protons and the Planck field into the universe. The universe emits a huge spectrum of frequencies that can tune our consciousness in a variety of ways. When we think about how sound affects our consciousness, we have the ability through chanting, through meditation, through song, to amplify our thoughts to a greater degree than perhaps most realize. And in amplifying our thoughts, we're having a direct effect on not only our own consciousness, but the consciousness of everyone that we come into contact with. It was found that when we use music, it tremendously increases our mental abilities. So music is not just for relaxation. It's not just for fun, but it's much more than that. With music, we can much easier transform to higher states of consciousness. You play a national anthem and people are ready to march into battle and lay down their lives. So music affects us dramatically. It's almost like we're in, in our culture, we're programmed by our music. Just imagine if we can actually apply this in a way that is directed at, at navigating or directing our culture into a higher frequency or vibration. That's where we're at right now. Music in general, listening or playing, is one of the few things that can light up the whole brain simultaneously as seen on an EEG scan. 
This can cause the consciousness to harmonize as we can use more of our total brain capacity in these coherent states. In all mystical traditions, people have been using music. Cultural traditions, people was using music. We can't comprehend our civilization without music. So without music, we don't have civilization. The rhythms of music that you listen to, or the rhythms of sounds that you expose yourself to, have a very entraining process on the psyche. And if you have the proper overlay of frequencies, you can actually bring the body into a harmonic state of resonance where the respiratory system slows down and the heartbeat slows down. Emotions such as anger, laughing, or crying can move us to be more synchronized with others. Entrainment is all around us at all times. Some examples of entrainment are when people are dancing together, or when women live together, often their menstrual cycles will sync up to the same rhythm. Or if you have a room full of pendulum clocks, over a short time, all of the pendulums will sync back and forth to the same rhythm. All rhythms of life seek harmony by the nature of the cosmic pattern underlying everything. The oldest instrument in the world was often used to bring an individual or group into a state of alignment. The didgeridoo can be used to entrain a group to a common frequency because like the monochord, it is one note. Or it can be used to entrain humans to the dream time, the cosmos, the earth, or each other. It creates a common vibrational field that all of those present can enter into together. This itself is a ceremony. The impacts can be felt spiritually, mentally, emotionally, as well as physically. There are two ways that sound affects us on a physical level. The first is called psychoacoustics, and this is where the sound goes into our ears, into our brains, affects our nervous system, our heart rate, our respiration, and our brain waves. Very powerful when we're listening to music, when we're hearing conversation, anytime we're using our ears. But there is a second way, and this way is called vibroacoustics, and this is where the sound goes into our body on a cellular level, going down to our molecules and our DNA. And this is a very powerful and important aspect of the phenomena of sound, and particularly resonance. Water is one medium that can help us visualize these impacts. Some of the most wondrous work was done by Masuro Imoto, and he took different sounds, different thoughts, different feelings, different vibrations, encoded it on the water, and the water would take on different wondrous geometric shapes. And my favorite of his pictures was a picture of the Fujiwara Dam. From Japan, which is a polluted dam, and it looked like mud. And then he had a Buddhist priest chant a mantra, the Heart Sutra, actually, over it. Gatte, gatte, para, gatte, para, some gatte bodhisattva, for 20 minutes. Rephotographed it, and it looked like the most perfect snowflake crystalline structure. Dr. Emoto showed that music, as well as the vibrations of thoughts and emotions, all have an impact on the structure and arrangement of water molecules, which stores this information as a kind of memory. We can re shape water and the structure of water and how much of our body 
is made of water? How much of our planet is made of water? Can we use sacred sound, intentional sound, to rearrange our molecular structure of water on our cells and our planet? We need only look to wisdom cultures from the past for answers. If you go into the Hindu cultures and the ancient Indian cultures, you discover that they have been talking about the fact that speaking and talking positively and acting positively creates positive karma. And when you're thinking and speaking and talking negatively, you're creating negative karma. So karma wor works in both ways. And so what they talk about literally is learning how to be of service to others, learning how to operate in the frequency of unconditional love, learning how to speak positive to yourself and also to others so that the universe will return back to you positivity. Every single culture on earth has some kind of meditation tradition and each of them centers on a very specific brainwave frequency. So Zen meditation is alpha and something like a shamanic journey is theta and the Dalai Lama with these monks meditating for 30 years, their meditation is gamma. So it's sort of like we've got the big God room with a bunch of doors. And each door is a different meditation practice from a different culture associated with different brain frequency. And one of those doors is like the perfect door for you. We can entrain your brain waves to exactly that pattern and pick the lock of that neural program and make it run. You're not gonna necessarily be enlightened like 30 year meditator, but We've stacked the deck in our favor with training wheels that is gonna cut 25 years out. <laughs> it's the promise of the 21st century. It's Star Trek high-tech meditation. Many options for expanding consciousness have existed since the beginning of human history. Auditory aids for expanded states of consciousness are a phenomena that have been found in shamanic, magical traditions since the beginning. Whether the shaman is rattling, hitting a drum, doing a chant, playing bells or bowls or blowing vessels, these are all designed to enhance altered states of consciousness, change brain waves, and possibly even go into our ears, into our brains, and actually affecting that portion of the brain, resonating it, that, if you like, enhances altered states of consciousness. We are now entering a new era of state-of-the-art consciousness technologies. We've got unprecedented tools We've got brain mapping EEG systems that can show precisely what brain frequencies are associated with different states of enlightenment. Regardless of the method, there is a special part of the brain that is activated by certain sounds. We know more about the pineal gland today than we did at any time in history. The pineal has long been thought of as the seat of the soul. It's the gland in the center of the brain. It's essentially the third eye. In 2002, Israeli researchers made an astounding discovery. They discovered that there's two types of crystals on and in the pineal gland, and that these crystals actually are tuners or resonators that if stimulated by sound, these crystals have the piezoelectric effect they release a positive charge. And this is quite amazing because meditators or people who have ever had an experience where they see a flash of blue light, for example, have experienced the pineal gland under a positive charge because we now know that the sound waves are converted by the pineal gland into blue light. This is very profound because in, often in Christian art and in other examples of art, you will see a blue halo around figures. That means that they have activated their pineal gland, probably through the force of sound. What do we feel when the pineal gland is activated or when we are entering expanded states? We're just listening and letting our body become into coherence with that which we're listening to safely. 
We're not activating what's called the amygdala in the brain, which means fear. We now are safe and we're vibrating, right? And so we're not judging, we're not in that state of mind. We completely transcended our default mode network. We would say we're inside the sound. If you have pictures of Emoto, it'd look like that in your head. All these ripples are moving through the inner ocean inside of you. The pineal gland itself will become, is like a tuning fork that just shakes like this, right? And it basically causes a spiral effect. That's what Raymond Moody, when he talks about death and dying, people move through this corridor drawn by sound. Basically, we're now able to ascend in octaves to different states of and different perceptions of reality. But while we're still in this state of earthly existence, we each have a purpose and decisions to make. We're all fated to walk this path in life, and the path is fated to land us at a fork. And when we arrive at this fork, I have to make a decision, which fork am I gonna make? And this one over here is the tugging of my heart and my soul is telling me, go that way, go that way. It's gonna make the best use of you. The universe says yes to you. This way is the path of safety. Adults in my life are saying, grow up, get a job, work for safety, uh, lay away some money on the side for your retirement. Most of us do that. Others take the road less traveled and enter into the universal hero's journey to find the meaning of my soul. And when I come to that fork, that's this right fork. I can't see how it's gonna work, but it pulls me. This is when the synchronicity starts. It's, it's the universe's job to step in and open the doors, turn the lights green, make everything serve to further. It becomes this flow, it becomes this synchronized, serendipitous adventure that you never know what's gonna happen. Is there a way to tune ourselves into the cosmic blueprint so that we're more inclined to take the hero's journey? The modern word for being in tune, for a person saying, I'm in tune, or an athlete saying, I'm in the zone, is neural coherence. Because our neuronal system, neurons are vibrating, right? And so therefore, when we have coherence, they are vibrating together in unison. In a state of neurocoherence, we're safe, we're calm inside, and we begin to perceive our world coherently. We begin to make choices that are better. Neurocoherence is a way of saying we are now in the zone in our life. We are perceiving and getting accurate information and feedback from our external reality, and we are now in a position to successfully adapt to it so we need neurocoherence to get accurate feedback. Perhaps it's not possible to be in the zone at all times, but if we can recognize our place in the unified field, we can always realign ourselves with the divine creation. From a physics perspective, all possibility exists as potential in the field. We are these amazing creatures that have this ability to simulate, to visualize all potentials. We get to imagine and question what would happen if I did this and what would this relationship look like and what if I built this device? We imagine these things, but they are potential until we breathe into that potential, our love or our fear for what we're imagining. And this is the scientific perspective for what our ancestors have told us for a long time. If we think of it and we love it, or we think of it and we fear it, those are the things that we bring into our world to experience. And when we begin to understand this, it empowers us to be creators in a way that we can learn and teach one another. Our greatest mastery is to know ourselves in the presence of, of this ability. What final lessons can modern neuroscience and masters from throughout time offer us? There is the work of a wonderful medical doctor, an autolangologist by the name of Alfred Tomatis, 
who wrote, among other things, a book called The Conscious Ear. He delineated listening from hearing. Hearing was a passive activity. Listening was an active activity. And when you listened, you were able to actually access different levels of consciousness, working with the emotional body. The phenomena of listening can be truly extraordinary. Whether you simply just sit there and take a moment, quiet yourself, and begin to listen to the sounds that are around you. And the sounds within you, you might be hearing your heartbeat, or breathing. Did you know that the word listen and the word silent are anagrams composed of the same letters? I like to say, be silent and listen. And as you enhance that, you are therefore altering the very way that you perceive reality. If we do all of this collectively, the results could be profound. We directly influence the collective, and, and that is what is needed right now. So from the very beginning, when we're told, in the beginning was the word, we are told the key to our success individually and also collectively. In the beginning is the power of the word, and the word is a frequency or it's a vibration. And it's the whole network of collective unconscious. And the network looks like a brain network, looks like a universal network. It's all the same business formed from the same standing waves, obeying the same rules of harmonics and overtones that we see in music. It's not so much a universe as a multi-lyric. <laughs> it's, a, it's a song of the universe. It's a, it's a dance. It's this thing where the collective unconscious mind way under the hood of all of us. It's sort of like the hundredth monkey thing. When a, a minimum quantum number of monkeys can wash their potatoes, all monkeys on all islands can now all of a sudden magically wash their potatoes. And that means that if we can network together at an unconscious, collective unconscious level, a minimum number of conscious entities who understand the principles that we're talking about, that we can tip the quantum field and we can have a spontaneous remission of the cancer that is humanity on planet Earth right now. The more of us who are in tuned in a positive, harmonious way of being, the greater the impact on the whole. Our exploration of the, the secret of sound or, and the sound of creation tells us something very important about ourselves. We individually are tuners in a way. We're like tuning forks. And it means that we all have the capacity of influencing or affecting everyone and everything that we come into contact with. At every moment, In our next episode, what did ancient civilizations know about the power of harnessing the human subconscious mind and the secrets of sacred sound? Was it enough to move mountains and build megalithic temples? The sonic mysteries behind the ancient megaliths is up next on Sound of Creation. Ready for more? Use the link in the description to watch even more episodes on Gaia. Enjoy.